Welcome to section 21.5. All right, gentle people, in this section, we are going to be talking about polymer chemistry. Now, a polymer is a macromolecule. It is a very, very, very big molecule. Now, the way that a polymer is formed is by taking what we call a monomer and building upon that monomer over and over and over and over again. So what I mean by that is you can kind of think of this as little Lego bricks. So if you have one little Lego brick, you can stick another Lego brick on it and another and another and another. And then suddenly you have this huge stack of Lego bricks all put together. So each individual brick is called a monomer. When you stick everything together, that's what we consider the polymer. Now, the background in polymer chemistry is actually quite interesting. There are a lot of serendipitous stories that occur with this. And what I mean by that is someone does some kind of chemistry and by accident, they make this unique polymer. One example is the one you see below you. What had happened is that there was a chemist and he wanted to make this molecule right here. Now, this is a very hard molecule. You're putting fluorines all around the carbon and then there's a double bond. So this chemist took a while to make it. And finally, once he had a laboratory process down, he decided to upscale his reaction. So this happens to be a gas. What he made about was four cylinders of this gas. After he made those four cylinders, he went home to have dinner and whatnot and was ready to come back in the morning to deal with it. On his return, what he found was it seemed like one of the cylinders had been emptied. And this didn't make sense because where would the gas have gone? So he did what anyone would have done and took a hacksaw to the cylinder. And when he cut that cylinder open, what he had found was the cylinder was coated in this white film. That film turned out to be Teflon. So what had happened is he polymerized his gas. He took this monomer right here, stuck this monomer over and over and over again, reacted it so that it became one big molecule made out of multiple monomers. Nowadays, what you will find is polymer chemistry is this billion dollar industry. It is the heart of making any kind of plastic you use. So let's go ahead and take a look at the polymerization reaction. The first type of polymerization reaction that I'm gonna go over is called free radical polymerization. Sometimes this is called addition polymerization. So I'm gonna go ahead and lead you through the steps. You can follow along on the slides. The first thing I need is something to kick off my polymerization. And so what I can use is I can use hydrogen peroxide. If I give this a little bit of heat, what can happen is I go ahead and cleave this bond right here. Now, if I cleave that bond and I cleave it in a specific way, what I will do is I will have what's called a free radical. Now this free radical, remember, is an unpaired electron. Unpaired electrons are very reactive. So I have this unpaired electron and it doesn't wanna be an unpaired electron. It wants to go ahead and find another electron to pair up with. So what I'm going to introduce is something with a double bond. In this case, I'm gonna use ethylene. Now what you'll notice about ethylene is that double bond, well, that is electron rich. There's a whole bunch of electrons on there. So what's gonna happen is this electron is going to steal one electron out of that double bond. And when I do this, I'm gonna form a new bond. I'm gonna have my rest of my ethylene but remember, there were four electrons in there. So if I steal one electron out of there, I'm still left with a lone electron or an unpaired electron. So I still have my free radical. And so remember what I told you, that free radical is a highly reactive molecule. 
So this molecule right here is going to continue to react. I'm going to redraw him. And what's going to happen is he is going to go ahead and see another ethylene molecule. He's going to go ahead and see that electron rich double bond and he's going to take one of those electrons. So that means I'm going to go ahead and form a new bond. So here's the new bond that forms. My double bond becomes a single bond, but again, I'm still running into that same problem where I have a leftover electron. And so this lone electron is going to continuously seek out another double bond. And what you guys will see is I'm going to continue to do this and build up my polymer chain. Now, eventually what's going to happen is two free radicals are going to meet each other and I terminate my reaction. But this is a chain reaction. I kick off my reaction in an initiation process, making a free radical. That free radical propagates by going ahead and finding another electron, but in doing so, it generates another free radical. That other free radical goes on and continues the reaction until finally it ceases. So in this respect, I took this monomer and I kept on reacting, using it, building one monomer on top of another monomer until I have a huge chain of molecules. Now, when I do the free radical polymerization, what I make are what's called homopolymers. And that means I took one monomer, stuck it together, and I'm repeating that monomer over and over and over again. What I want you guys to be able to do is to tell me what the structure of the polymer is going to be. So if I start out with this monomer right here, what you guys will see is I'm going to repeat that unit over and over again. And so what you guys can do is you can draw the molecule, you can put braces around it, and say that this repeats over and over and over again, and that is what that notation means. Now, I want you to be able to go both ways. So if I give you the monomer right here, you should tell me the structure of the polymer, but you can also work your way backwards. If I go ahead and give you what the polymer looks like, you should be able to tell me what monomer used was to construct that polymer. Realize that any side chains off of that double bond, well, that's going to get repeated. So if I take a look at this molecule right here, what you guys will see here is that I had a CH that was double bonded to a CH2. Off of that CH was a CH3. And so this CH3 got repeated when I made my polymer chain. Now, I don't have to have simple substituents. For example, if I go ahead and put a benzene ring instead of a methyl group, I can repeat that benzene ring over and over and over again. And so you guys have probably come across this polymer. This is what we call polystyrene. This one up top, polypropylene, is what you find in your plastic water bottles. Now the polymer industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and depending on the catalyst, we can control the chain reaction. And so we can go ahead and control certain aspects of how the polymer grows. Let's take a look at polymerizing propylene. Now, if I were to go ahead and polymerize this, what you guys would see is this is my carbon chain that I have one right after each other. You'll notice that each one of these carbons has four bonds to it with no lone pairs. So that means that each one of these carbons is tetrahedral. And remember how I said to draw a tetrahedral, line, line, dash, wedge. So if I make my polymer backbone, so all the carbons that are connected together as my lines, well, then I can put my dashes and wedges on there. Now, what you'll see is in this case, around my double bond, I had a CH3 that gets repeated. Now, one way that I can have this is I can make 
all the CH3s, I can make all the CH3s pointed towards you. So I can put them all on that wedge right there. So that means that all my CH3s are going into the same direction. If I have something like that, I call that an isotactic configuration. Now, another way that I could do it is I can have the CH3s alternate. I can have one going towards you, one away from you, one towards you, and one away from you. So in this alternating pattern, what I can say is that this is the syndiotactic configuration. Now, the isotactic configuration makes polymers that are more crystalline. Now, a more crystalline polymer makes more clear polymers. So if you guys have seen plastic bottles that are clear, well, that's probably because they used an isotactic version of the polymer. For those plastic bottles that are kind of opaque, that you can't really see through, that's probably because they used a syndiotactic polymer. Now, there's other things that control the properties of our plastics. One of the things is how long your polymer chain is. So when I talk about putting these monomers together, I can talk about them being together in the thousands, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, and even bigger than that. Now, the more monomers I string together, well, that's going to affect how that polymer behaves. The longer it is, the more LDFs that they have. The more LDFs that they have, the, the stronger my plastic is going to be. It's going to be more rigid and have more strength. Now, the problem becomes is that the longer I make my polymer, the less soluble it also is. So it's going to be harder to manipulate. So there's always a give and take when you work with polymers and you have to pick the right size to get the right properties. Now, another thing that we can change to change polymer properties or plastic properties is how much it branches. When we go ahead and grow our polymer, we can choose catalyst that gives us linear polymers where there is no branching. On the other hand, we can specifically choose catalyst where I will have a whole bunch of branching. Now, what this changes is how much the polymers can actually interact with each other. When I have linear polymers, well, they can go ahead and stack one right on top of each other. When I have branched polymers, what you guys will see is the branches get in the way of them stacking, so it's harder to put them together. And so what this leads to is high density polymers and low density polymers. Now you guys can see this manifest. If your lunch box is made out of plastic, that plastic is probably hard. And that means you have a high density polymer, probably with a lot of polymer chains that are linear. If you look at a Ziploc bag or a plastic bag, it's quite flimsy. And the reason it's quite flimsy is it probably because you have branched polymers that make sure that the polymers don't get close to each other. So all these factors come into play when you guys make plastics. Now let's talk about a different method to polymerize something. What I can do is make a copolymer. A copolymer is made from two separate monomers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this diol. And by diol, I mean it has two alcohol groups on it. Now with the diol, I'm going to go ahead and combine that with a diacid. I have two carboxylic acids on the ends of my molecule. Now what I can do is a reaction that we talked about before, and that is a condensation reaction. So that means I can go ahead and combine an alcohol and an acid, and what I will form is a dimer. Now, what you guys will notice is the ends of this dimer. On the ends of this dimer, I still have a carboxylic acid and I still have an alcohol. So what I can do is I can take this molecule and condense it with itself. I can take this carboxylic acid and this alcohol and put it together and I will form another ester. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep forming this ester linkage. And what you guys will notice is that if I have many esters, well, that would be a polyester. And so if you look at that fabric material, polyester, well, what they did to make that fabric was a condensation reaction. Now, the one that I'm showing you here is the polyester where I'm using a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. But I can do a condensation polymerization using other kinds of groups. What I can also use to do a condensation polymerization is I can use an amine. So remember what an amine is, it's gonna be a carbon singly bound to a nitrogen. In this particular case, I'm gonna have two hydrogens, so this is gonna be a primary amine. Now what I can do is I can do a condensation reaction. I can take the hydrogen off my amine, combine it with an OH off a carboxylic acid, and what I can form is called the amide bond. Now, we didn't talk about this functional group, uh, but it will be important when we start talking about biopolymers because an amide bond also is called a peptide bond. And the linkage that we have here is we have our nitrogen attached to the rest of the molecule, and this nitrogen is attached to our carbonyl carbon to the other half of the molecule. Now, that nitrogen is still going to retain that hydrogen on there. Now, again, this is unfortunate because usually I would do a demo for you guys. So in this case, I'm going to try to insert a YouTube video so that you guys can see nylon being formed in front of your eyes by layering two liquids. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that video. So now let's go ahead and do an eye clicker question to finish off this section. So here's the polymer that I want you guys to look at. I want you to tell me what monomer is used to create this polymer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so let's go ahead and answer ourselves a few questions. What you will notice is I don't have any ester linkages, nor do I have any peptide or amide bonds. So this is not done through condensation. This is an addition polymer. So I know that I'm going to have to have something with a double bond and a free radical polymerize that double bond. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find my repeating unit. So what you guys can see is that what I've boxed, if I repeat that over and over, I can go ahead and generate the rest of this polymer. So this is the... So this is the smallest chunk that is repeating, so my monomer has to be built out of this. So a better way to express this polymer is what I've drawn right here, that small repeating unit. Now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and find out what alkene I use to generate this polymer. So remember how this bond was formed. This bond to the rest of the molecule was formed by one free radical and an electron from the double bond. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the reverse. I'm gonna fold in these bonds. So if you think of a bond being made out of two electrons, one electron is going to go away, but one electron is gonna come into my double bond. I'm gonna repeat this for the other side by making that bond made out of two electrons and folding in one electron. So if I do that, this was my original double bond, this was my CH2, and on this side was my CH3s attached to that first carbon in the double bond. If you guys take a look, that should have been choice B. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1C, and remember to stay safe.